Bartok is such an important composer. Many people feel the most important composer of the first half of our century. And then I can't possibly cover all the facets of this personality and of his work. I'm going to confine myself just to the folk music, and perhaps there will be time for one or two uh, remarks on other aspects. I can't give you a stylistic analysis, I can't give you a harmonic analysis, I can't give you structural analysis. All these things are outside of my field, so what I'm doing is something very one side. But I am under the impression that just as there are few pianists who play the Chopin mazurkas with real good style, there are even fewer pianists who play Pato with real good style. The Chopin mazurkas are by now pretty much in the mainstream of our music, and it isn't necessary to hear Polish folk music in order to arrive at a reasonable rendition of it. Uh, Chopin Mazurka. Uh, Bartok and the sources from which he took much, if not the majority of his works, is so far outside of our horizon, and his music is still so new that very often one hears Bartok play well, but not with what Hungarians at least would regard as good Bartok style. And so I think it is necessary to immerse oneself to some extent in the world and in the music from which he culled his compositions. At least those compositions that are immediately connected with folk music. You know that his greater works, like the Sonata for Piano, by the folk elements, or the Sonata for Two Pianos and Percussion, uh, do not really have honest to goodness, folk tunes as their basis. And even in the small pieces of Bartok, as for instance in the Four Children, it was very surprising to me that only about half are based on actual folk tunes, the other half are made up tunes. But he had identified himself so much with the folk music that he could write folk tunes that were truer than the real folk tunes. So much um, for that. So I am trying to, to give you somehow a background for a style of art of play. Let me start uh, with one aspect of it. Aldo Honecker says, Bartok's music calls for greater effort and precision than classical music. Bartok's music calls for greater effort and precision in classical music. And that is very true as far as it goes. Because, as you all know, Bartok was a fanatic, almost, in notating exactly what he wished to write down. He has marcato signs like this, and marcato signs like this. He has lines for Tenuto and so on and so on. He has metronome markings and he has duration markings down to seconds. So obviously he was very, very concerned about notating correctly and he was very clever about it. Not all composers are very clever in notating their intentions. Schumann, for instance, uh, is not a clever composer in notating. Uh, he writes, uh, he writes triple for Sandos, you see that he wants a little accent. And uh, you have to take Schumann's notation with a grain of salt. Other composers that you see, for instance, are very, very clever and very meticulous. Now, Bartok uh, was one of the very meticulous composers. Where he breaks down, even he breaks down, is in notating his pedals. And that is proved by the fact that uh, he does not play on the, on the few recordings that we have. He does not follow his own pedal marks. And it is also interesting that he himself changed many of the metronome markings in the second edition of his Four Children collection, and that the records again disagree with uh, what metronome markings he gave in 
uh, the printed music. So this aspect of Bartok is something that we must very much take into account, be conscious of, and uh, on the other hand, have the courage sometimes to disagree, but certainly we must know what Martin C. did. In, in this context, I would also say that in Bartok, as well as in other composers whose music is motoric, whose music is based on an uh, uh, almost machine-like beat, ta -ta 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 -ta. the absence of slurs is as important as the presence of slurs. You see, to try to romanticize Bartok by making long slurs phrasings out of that rather atomic beat um, is probably wrong. So when Bartok does not write his slur, one should not play too legato. It should be a a somewhat detached kind of touch, which doesn't by any means mean banging. Uh, part of told, I think it was Ferdish, is to uh, at one in one lesson, don't play it so bad of here. <laughs> uh, because he hated uh, banging piano playing. His friend I hear in in, in uh, uh, composition of Mozart and Bach, and anybody who has Bach and Mozart has his ideas would not uh, like in sonority that uh, is percussive. Now, another aspect that I must at least briefly touch on is the fact that in Bartok, perhaps more than in any composer, the language from which he <coughs> comes and the language in which the folk tunes uh, from which he takes issue is of enormous importance. And again, Hungarian is the language of which we know nothing, and that includes me, but which we must at least understand in its general structure. It is a language which in Europe at least has only one relative, and that is Finnish. If you speak Hungarian to a Finn, he will think, well, am I hard of hearing? Why don't I understand what the guy is saying, and vice versa. They are related languages. They are somewhat closer related, I understand, than French and Italian, but still an Italian doesn't understand French or and neither does a Finn understand a Hungarian. They both belong to the finno ugric language family, and that would all be very nice if Bartok's music, or rather the folk music, were not really at least half of it, let's say, heightened recitation. See, our, our poetry and our songs are not heightened reci recitation. They are, they are based on entirely different uh, aesthetic criteria. Even a folk song is uh, not heightened recitation. But Asiatic music is very largely heightened recitation. And I'm going to quote you one sentence from a uh, dissertation uh, proposal or topic that says as follows, and it's not about Hungarian, it's about another language. This man who got his doctorate recently says, as in poetry, where the unconscious interplay of stress and syllabic structure present in language are abstracted and consciously employed as meter and rhyme, music strikes the total elements of speech, intonation, and arranges them consciously for theoretical purposes. You see, if music is based so completely on language, and Hungarian music, much of Hungarian music is, it is purely syllabic. Each tone is one syllable. It is enormously important to know a little something about that language. Now, there are several things that you might keep in mind. First of all, in Hungarian, as in any language, there are stressed syllables and unstressed syllables. But there are no really short syllables. There are no really short syllables. And that is the reason why Hungarians try to speak English before they learn English very well. Speak with this strange kind of drawl, if you want to call it that. Uh, they will say, never be less. And they will say, all together. And they will say, all the mother of 
Yes. <laughs> and it is these long syllables that are characteristic for Hungarian. Then Hungarian has another characteristic <coughs> that is less important for our purposes, but I might just mention it. Hungarian works very much with prefixes and suffixes. You see the pieces of the nouns and the, the, the uh, tempora of the verb are all signified by syllables that precede the stem and syllables that follow the stem. And a nylon verb that has a certain prefix will have a change in the stem vowel even though that prefix has already been half an hour before the stem came. And we refer to this phenomenon as the vowel harmony. Now, for instance, a verb, you see, that has is a stem, head, head, leg, yes? When it is preceded by a, yes, by e, a, it becomes head, head, leg, shake, bam, yes? However, if it is preceded by all, the stem changes to hall atlan shagabam, yes, or some such thing, you see? So that is vowel harmony, the influence of a first syllable on the rest of the verb. Should there be a Hungarian here, he's probably sick at this point, because what I say is at least 50% wrong, probably more, but I mean for a layman, and that excludes me in, uh, it's probably all we can we can uh, say. I don't think it is completely wrong. Uh, more important than any of this is the fact that all Hungarian words, without exception, are accepted on the first syllable. On the first syllable. That is true in other languages too. Uh, Czech is of the same kind. French and it has exactly the opposite. All French words with very few exceptions for express purposes are uh, accepted on the last syllable. So the the uh, graph of a the graph of a Hungarian sentence is always a falling graph. Tau. Tau. And since the folk music or some of the folk music or most of the folk music is syllabic, you see, and it's just hyphen recitation. You must always keep these two facts in mind. That the first syllable has the main stress, that there are no really short notes, and that it is completely wrong to think of, of the Hungarian endings of any phrase in terms of Of these melodies is 
scarcely above a hexachord, scarcely above a six, and it's always in two and two measures. Uh, things like this. This is the children's tune. Uh, Children's uh, game songs of this kind are not only songs, they are pantomime. Yes, it's, it's uh, da, 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 something of that kind. It's half dance, half song, half pantomime, what have you. So the connection between song and dance is very strong even in this simple uh, primitive music. Uh, I would like you to hear one. Uh, game type of song, song by a woman of this kind. Two and two and two and two measures, yes? Tu rodi snu o verem bacio kofi la latik, bukur mellett a konac, menyecs kivel játszik, még ös merem a konac, sok a járás áru, csönge bönge a celáru, fényös volt a járu. So that is this type of music and Pato uses it very, very often uh, for as basis for his uh, compositions. Now, not only children's game songs are, are, of, uh, are, basis, uh, are, are on this basis, but um, other songs are of the same kind. For instance, training songs. Training songs. Um, uh, songs, uh, shepherd songs, swine herd songs and the like and also festival songs, songs sung at certain festival occasions. Now, one of the pagan festivals, uh, uh, festival um, activities is, for instance, uh, to, uh, um, at marriages, to carry pillows around, you see, it's symbolic, of course, yes? And they carry pillows around. And so number four in the, in the children's pieces is a pillow dance. And based exactly on this two measure, two measure, two measure uh, uh, business, but you will uh, immediately see what he does with it. I'm going to play that. Thing. Each tone would represent a syllable. And this is where 
not be torn down as far as clean uh, back of this time. Now this um, kind of free uh, recitation, syllabic free recitation, uh, has various uh, aspects. One of the most striking ones is the dirge. And Balkov wrote dirges, as you know, but they are not played very much. Why are they not played very much? Because that is perhaps the most foreign part of Balkov's music. If you've ever been uh, in a Mediterranean country, and I've lived for one year in Naples, and you've seen the funeral, then you understand what is the background of this kind of music. You see, death is a very, a very important part of life, I would almost say, in all Mediterranean and Eastern countries. We keep a stiff upper lip, we don't mention death very much, it's not pleasant to talk about. There, um, death is made much of, and the show of emotion is very uninhibited and very obvious, and, and one does the death uh, honor by that show of emotion, so much so that even wailing women are hired to heighten the sadness and, 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 and mourning. And so I want to play you one tape of a wailing song of a dirge sung by an old woman. It goes on much, much longer than I, uh, I recorded because it's very repetitious, but you will see what these dirges sound like in uh, the original. Jaj, jaj, én nekem bónatos a nyónat. Jaj, 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 Gézikom, úgy elrabultak a fiam tőle. Gézikom, Gézikom, ú, vagy édes fiam, drága gyereké. Jaj, 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 minden szentek napja, úgy arkálok a sírok közt, hogy nem tanálom a sírodot, Gézikom, édes pia! Gézikom, de zsőkém! De zsőkém, édes fiam! Drága gyerekeim! Oké, okay, could go on for another five minutes, yes? Uh, now the characteristic of this music is of course the falling line, uh, a steel basis that has nothing to do with our traditional major minor, uh, doesn't even necessarily have anything to do with church modes, uh, and is purely syllabic, with the exception of a few outcries, etc. that we saw up here. So these are basically the two extremes of Bartok's uh, uh, sources, the Tempo Giusto and the Palato. Very often he combines these two, and has one section in one style and another section in another style. I'll play you uh, his little composition, Evening in the Country. It's uh, the American edition, I believe. Actually, it is called Evening in Transylvania. And I want to mention, uh, to go into that a little bit more. Uh, he announces that himself. He was one of his favorite uncles. And there you will find the Fernando uh, type combined with the Tempo Giusto. I one of the one of the
shape combination of this Fernando style with the two rather separate phrases or two pictures. And again, there is a relation between the two tunes. Again, it's the principle of variation that he uses here. Now, I mentioned this uh, original title of Evening in Pennsylvania because it's for us as piano teachers and pianists, it is interesting to uh, see that there is a very noble tradition at work here. There is a college in Kentucky, I believe, Pennsylvania College, isn't it? I believe, yes? Isn't it fun? Yes. yes. And what does Transylvania mean? Transylvania means the country on the other side of the woods. Yes, silver in Latin is wood, and trans means on the other side. So Kentucky, for the Easterners, was on the other side of the woods, of the Alleghenies, yes? So Transylvania is the country on the other side of the woods. And so is Hungary for the Germans, you see, it's on the other side of the Alps. Consequently, Hungary was sometimes called Transylvania, and he calls it evening in Transylvania. Now, uh, another interesting concept that I want to mention along the same line is that, of course, not only dirges, but mostly ballads. The ballad type of pieces are in this Palamo uh, uh, style. Now, for instance, the Christian Hungarian peasant songs. Uh, that Mr. Schneller played yesterday, which is this G minor band, and I forget I saw uh, in English name. Or play, and very many of them are not uh, 
some fumes, but also um, instrumental uh, fumes. And I think I would like to um, play you um, one um, piece that is an instrumental tune and is played on a flute and a bagpipe. And those are the two principal instruments of Hungarian folk music. Of course, it is not a silver flute pont spercier. Uh, it is a very primitive kind of recorder on which it is played. And uh, the bagpipe is not even as beautiful sounding as a Scottish or as an Italian bagpipe. It is a very raw instrument, and the flute is very squeaky and, and rather ugly sounding. But those are two very typical folk instruments. <laughs> Thank you. 